Well, it's great to have Jaylene Daniels here on Sports Spectrum today. Hi, Jaylene. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you weren't Jaylene Daniels when we last had you on. It was uh, <laughs> January of 2020 when our last interview, uh, th- th- our last conversation that we had actually ran. Uh, your last name's changed. You're a mom of two now. It's amazing what can happen. We had a pandemic, you know, I mean, amazing what can happen in for four plus years, huh? It's wild. A roller coaster for sure. Yes. Well, let's start with, I always like to start with Jesus. That's probably the best place to start any conversation on our show. Let's start with Christ right now and kind of having you share the Lord, who he is and how he's working in your life today. Yeah. I mean, it sounds cliche, but my relationship with the Lord is everything. Um, I grew up with a relationship with him and I just feel over the years, it's just personally become my own. And so it's been sweet to, even since our last conversation, the ways that he has just transformed and done something new in my life each year. So that's been sweet. Um, and yeah, right now I'm just in Raleigh, North Carolina. Like you mentioned, I have two girls. Um, she, one, our oldest is about to be three and mm-hmm. our youngest is four months. And so it's just been wow. a, a journey of motherhood from being a professional soccer player to um, this new adventure, but it's been sweet. You are in it right now, especially yeah. with a four-month-old. But I think about the three-year-old. Like the four-month-old, you can kind of just set them down. They eat, they sleep, you burp them, yeah. you, you change them. The three-year-old's probably running around like uh, you know, like a terror right now, I would imagine. She is the best, but she is three going on 30. And <laughs> it is a joy and also the greatest challenge of my life. <laughs> yeah. No, they're the best. Uh, and it's every stage. I was just talking to uh, another person who was talking about seasons of life and talking about the different seasons as parenting uh goes and like you can even see it right now between like this four month old that in just a couple years is going to be where this three-year-old is and then in three years your three-year-old is going to be like a first grader yeah it just goes by so fast it's been so fast the fact that we have a four month old like i really think we just brought her home from the hospital and i can say the same thing about our three-year-old i'm like we just brought you home yes it's wild but it's so fun It is. It's a great season of life. And we'll talk more about kind of what God is doing in this season of life with you in a second. I want to go back a little bit because you went to a private Christian school when you were in high school, uh, Valor Christian, which is right around the corner from the Sports Spectrum headquarters in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Um, That's not where I am, but that's where our team is, right in Highlands Ranch there. Um, Then you went and attended Texas Tech. And I really want to have people who maybe didn't listen to our first conversation have you share you said you grew up in a Christian home, and maybe you could kind of pick up the story from that. But it really culminates with a moment your junior year at Texas Tech um, that kind of brings you into the limelight here with not just your faith and, and kind of confronting on who God is, but you know, almost having to understand this is the soccer thing might not happen either. And I'm glad it did, but there was a pretty key moment there. Can you kind of take us through quickly what happened in the story that goes on with that? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home, went to a private Christian high school. So I had this um, great perception of who Jesus was, but definitely didn't have a relationship like I do now. Um, And that really didn't culminate until my junior year of college. And those first two years of college were very lukewarm, still showed up to church on Sundays, but definitely was living a a double life definitely during the week. Um, And so my junior year of college, the NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League, had just formed, and my college coach was like, hey, I think you should put your name into the draft. And I was kind of wrestling with this idea of do I want to even continue playing soccer? Um, just kind of was in this, like, burnout season, I would say. Yeah. And so we had this conversation the spring of my junior year. Um, I started getting this pain in my left leg, and we really didn't know what it was stemming from. And being an athlete, you're always wrestling something, some sort of soreness or fatigue. So we didn't really think much of it. Um, but as the month kind of progressed, this pain kept getting worse. And so by the end of my spring season, we were going to play the Houston Dash, um, one of the new teams in the league. And so my coach was like, if you can just get through this game, we'll get back to Lubbock. We'll, you know, reevaluate what's going on. And so I ended up playing in this game. It was an eight hour bus ride from Lubbock to Houston. The whole ride, the whole game, like I've never had pain outside of, I think, childbearing and birth. Yeah. Um, this pain was excruciating. And so we finally get back to Lubbock after this game. Um, we go in for an ultrasound and the technician is like chatting it up with me and kind of halfway through this ultrasound, she kind of just gets this blank stare 
isn't talking. And so I know it's bad, but she can't tell me what's going on. And so she goes out of the room, tells me the doctor's going to um, come and visit with me. But it actually is my athletic trainer that comes in. And she's like, Jaylene, you have this blood clot um, that's starting at the top of your groin and running to the middle of your calf. Um, and essentially, you have no blood flow coming up out of your leg. Everything's going down, but nothing's coming back up. And so we need to do an emergency surgery. And in my head, I have no idea. I, I associate blood clots with old people like you get them when you're old. So I didn't really know the extent of like why this was so serious. Yeah. Um, so they're breaking it down. They're like, this could break off to your brain, your heart, your lung. Like this really is a miracle that hasn't broken off yet. Um, and so I go into surgery. My parents are on a flight from Denver, which is where I'm from. And when they get um, to the hospital, the doctor comes in. He's like, we got none of the blood clot out. You have 80 percent of your vein is closed. So again, like nothing's coming um, out of your leg. And so if we can't get into your leg, into those veins by tomorrow morning, we're going to put a stent in. Um, you're going to have that for the rest of your life. You'll be on blood thinners the rest of your life and you can't play sports. Um, and to say I was angry would probably be like the understatement of the century, more so because I wanted to decide kind of the trajectory of my future. In my mind, I was like, I'll consider, you know, playing professionally. But in that moment, it just kind of felt like you don't even get to decide. And I really had no plan B. I knew I was getting a degree, but I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Like, I really thought I at least had another year of soccer in college. Um, and so we get through this conversation. Um, and my mom really was our spiritual leader growing up in our home. And so that whole night, she's just praying over me. And I'm on these like pain pill, painkillers that are like bringing me in and out of consciousness. But really, every time I woke up that I can remember, she was praying. Um, yeah. And I just felt so challenged in this situation to just like say my own prayer because she was so adamant that not necessarily like Lord heal her so she can keep playing, but just heal her because we know you can. Um, and so I didn't tell her or my dad. I just said this prayer in my hospital bed. And I just said, you know, Lord, I know I haven't been living up to what you ask of us, you know, but if you would help me out of this situation, like I'll at least start to discover. I didn't commit my life. I didn't say, if you give me this, I'll take that. But it was just like, I'll really like venture into what it means to follow you. And so the next morning, going to surgery, come out a couple of hours later and the doctor comes in. And I mean, this is truly how he started the conversation. He says, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in miracles, but your vein was completely open. We got all the clut out from your um, hamstring. You'll be on blood thinners for three months. And I don't see this being a problem moving forward. Hmm. And I, just in my own way, I just was like, what just happened? Like, not only did God hear me, but he healed me. Um, and he just became so like personal and tangible in that moment. And it really was this like no turning back moment of like, OK, what does this look like to walk with Jesus in relationship? And so April 4th, 2014 was the day I surrendered to the Lord and have just kind of been walking with him ever since. Well, I love the story for a couple of reasons. First of all, everybody has to have kind of a starting point of surrender. Surrender is different than just than just saying, I believe. I think surrender is a, is a different level. It's a next step, if you will, after starting with the belief, which you had had for, for a long time. But then there's this promise factor. Like you said, you, you didn't make a promise to God. You just said you would discover and you would continue to move forward and growing and learning and trying to figure out, you know, what the best, I guess, way to approach this relationship with, with Jesus is, but you did it out of an act of surrender. And so I love that because I think a lot of people try to look at God as this sort of this deal, this dealer, right? You can walk in and you say, I'll do this if you do that. Yeah. And I think God doesn't work that way. Like he, his plans are so much better than ours, but if we start trying to make deals here, um, you know, let's be honest. If he, if he answered the real, this is my thinking here. Tell me if I'm off Jaylene. Yeah. If he had answered your actual prayer, you would have went and played 15 seasons and been an all-star and Olympic gold medalist and all these things and reached the highest level and not had to go through what you went through for quite a few years uh, as a professional soccer player. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could just comment off that on why God is, he's not a transactional God in that, in that realm, like his grace and, and what he did on the cross is enough. Yeah, absolutely. I think, as you said, like, I think when it's just a factor of belief, then we think that following Jesus means a better life. And I do believe that my life is better in following Jesus. But sure. then we just almost seem as a genie. Like if I continue to follow you, you'll give me all my hopes and my dreams and the resources I need. And I think it just eliminates that faith factor of like, do I believe God is good? 
if X, Y, and Z were to happen and none of my dreams actually come to fruition, or I do hit this valley that I didn't think I'd have to walk through. And so I, I do think as you've expressed that there's a difference between belief and surrender. And, and when we follow Jesus, we're kind of signing up for whatever his ways are, because they're better. Even if in the moment it feels like, I feel like my way would be better through this, you know? Yeah. But, you know, that line that people have, um, God will give us never, never give us more than we can handle. And I always say, no, no, no. Yeah. He's totally giving us more than we can handle. So yeah. we're going to be fully dependent on him. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> it's so true. So true. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think it's, um, it's part of what, I guess, quote unquote, what we sign up for. Right. And, and I mean that in the best way possible on who God is. We just put our trust in him and he's going to, he's going to direct our steps. Um, let's talk about, I guess, there's something that you said earlier that I really wanted to harken back to for a minute. You said that you were kind of living a double life and I'm talking to the people who are listening, who might be in the athletic space, coaches go through this athletes, even people in the space I've been in the media space for many years. Yeah. I think as believers, we want to say we're fully in and we're fully surrendered to Christ, but our jobs, our, our lifestyles, our daily living of things that we do, whether you're a student, maybe you're a college student as well, like all of that can really begin to, I don't know, take shape a little bit. So can you unpack a little bit what you meant by living a double life and um, maybe some encouragement for those that are struggling as well? with yeah. sort of two idols, if you will, between God and between maybe the work that we do or the identity that we associate with? Yeah, I think when I referenced it in my testimony of just a double life of this idea that I grew up in a church setting, so I quote unquote knew all the right answers. Like I knew the biblical truths, what verse to go to when you're I'm feeling anxiety or fear or all the things. And I think it was very sur surface level in the sense I was really living very religiously. Um, and to the outside looking in, it probably looked like, man, she's got it all together. Um, but none of it was actually like resonating in my heart. Like, why do I actually want to follow the things that the Bible speaks on? Why do I want to live differently? Um, and so it was almost kind of like this safety net, if you will, like I'm going to follow Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. Um, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like, I want to follow Jesus because he's worth following. Um, right. and so I think the double standard was playing into the sense of like, I'm going to have the safety net to fall into when my life comes to an end and say that I knew Jesus, but very much was living in that place of like, I think I would have gotten to, you know, the gates of heaven and would have been like, apart from me, I don't know you, um, yeah. from the relational piece. And so I think my encouragement of those who maybe like are in this place of like, I think I'm doing all the right things, but I wouldn't necessarily say I've surrendered or I'm walking in a relationship with the Lord. I think the encouragement would be just to the place that I started was just to start, I think, um, discovering more of who Jesus is, like asking those hard questions. Well, why do I believe this? Why is this important to me? Um, getting involved in community. I think after my junior year and all that happened that year, it was really important to me to find the right friends, to find a mentor. Um, to be more encouraged by people who were walking with the Lord and not just saying like, I'm a Christian, because that's a very popular and I maybe not as popular today of a thing to say, but I think it was a very normal thing to be like, I'm a Christian. Like I go to church on Sunday, I go on Easter and Christmas and I'm good. Um, and so I think just more of the actual um, pursuit maybe is a better word of, you know, who is this guy named Jesus and why, why should I follow? Well, in the pursuit is the discovery, which I love the two words that you use because I think they're both kind of inter interchangeable in this walk with Christ that we both um, are on. So they say that our testimonies are, aren't are without tests. You just described one pretty big test your junior year. Um, I want to ask before we get to the bigger test that others might be thinking I'm going to ask about, which I am, I want to ask about just the test that might have came your way when you turned pro because you were the seventh overall pick and that and WSL draft, as you mentioned, and coming to the professional ranks, what was that like turning pro? And now you have to balance out the lifestyle of not living that double life that you just described. Yeah. But you want to pursue excellence in soccer, but also pursue excellence as a follower of Christ. What was that yeah. time like? Yeah, I think that transition was the hardest um, because you go from playing with girls that are at least in this like four year age span. So you're not too far behind or ahead of your teammates, but then you get into the professional league and, you know, you get drafted at 21 and you might have a teammate that's 32, 33. They have a family. They're in a different season of life. 
Um, they've played at the highest level, where the highest le level I've played at was college. Um, and that's still a feat in and of itself. But then you're playing with the top players from all of those colleges. So there's just this transition of like, gosh, like I was playing at the highest level and now this is the next highest level. And you're just kind of navigating this space as the rookie, kind of like the freshman year again. Um, and then I do think it even becomes that much more challenging to live out your faith. Um, because, I mean, you do have this awareness and like sense of freedom as a collegiate player, but then professionally, um, people start to recognize you or like know your name. You get invited to do more things, more worldly things. Um, and so I think there's just this more increased temptation um, to again revert back to those like, as long as I'm in church, I'm good. And, you know, I'll repent occasionally and the Lord will forgive me because his grace is enough. And you just kind of start to, um, I think, kind of dive back into old ways. So I think the hardest part in that transition, kind of like you were mentioning, is just, okay, I have to find community again. Like I'm going from Texas to New York. So I need to make sure that there's a church that I'm going to and I'm getting plugged in and finding the right friends. Um, and then also just building new relationships. Um, I think from the beginning, and not the best way possible um, from conversations I had with teammates, and it's cool to see how the Lord even worked through that, but was so strict in the sense that people were like, okay, I don't really know if, you know, we should invite Jalen to anything. Um, but then I think over time, you just start to navigate those spaces more of like, no, like I want to have relationship and build a relationship. But these are just kind of the things that, you know, I personally want to stay away from. And so, yeah, I think you're just kind of growing up all over again in a, in a new way. No, that's good. Yeah, I think especially as you're trying to also like be great at soccer <laughs> and, yeah. and do the best you can in that. Uh, it's a lot for a person to to walk through. A couple yeah. of years later, um, 2017, that's where you're invited to be on the USA uh, national team. And that's when things go kind of crazy. Can you kind of share, um, because you're thrusted into a spotlight that I, it was almost like the spotlight that everybody's thrusted into today. You mm -hmm. were like one of the, I hate to say pioneers, so forgive me, that's not what I mean. Okay. But it's kind of like this new social media uproar that's been happening for seven, eight, nine years. Yeah, you were part of that a little bit in 2017. Can you kind of share what that was like to walk through? Because you still stood firm in your faith. And I know that that wasn't easy to do. Yeah. Um, so I got drafted in 2015. And right after my rookie season was my first invite with the US Women's National Team. And so they had just won the Women's World Cup. They were starting to build out for their Olympic roster. And my national or my professional team had not had a great year by any means. Um, so I was genuinely shocked when I first got that call up and I'd be with them um, through what is like their cycle year, I guess. And so I was with them right before they got um, Jill Ellis would pick her Olympic roster for 2016. So I didn't make that roster was super heartbroken, but the Lord really taught me a lot about just my self-confidence um, really bouncing back from what felt like a really big defeat. And so it would take another year before I get that next call up and that would come in 2017. And so I got the call in May camp was in June. The plan was to play Sweden twice in Sweden. And so I was pumped, really excited. Um, and we were actually in Chicago, about to play Chicago, when I found out that the national team would be wearing pride theme jerseys um, in support of the LGBTQ community. And so my mom was actually the one who told me about it. And I initially didn't have a response. She kind of chatted up. She's like, so what are you thinking? And I was like, I don't really know. Um, I know I'm probably going to be asked to do something, but definitely not sure what. Um, and so I had actually called my team chaplain after I had found out and I was like, Hey, this is kind of what I just found out, not really sure what to do with it. And so she was the one who kind of helped me navigate how I would make a decision regarding it all. And so on the phone, she was like, I just have a suggestion. And I was like, by all means, tell me what your suggestion is. Um, <laughs> she was like, well, how do you feel about praying and fasting for three days? And so when I found out about this, it was a week before we were supposed to leave. So I really didn't have like three days to like, Hey, Leah, let me pray and process about this. But I was like, okay, like, I definitely want to do something that would involve really seeking the Lord about this. And so I got back from Chicago. I asked my mom and sister and a mentor of mine to just give up something, to fast something, whether it was food or social media or whatever, sure. and to pray. Um, and so over those three days, that's what we did. And at the end of them, I really just sensed that the Lord was asking me not to wear the jersey. Um, and I really didn't know how I was going to communicate that to the team, what it would look like when I did communicate it. But um, I really just felt felt convicted that that was what I was being asked to do. And so I eventually had a conversation um, with the coach, Jill Ellis at the time. 
I told her, you know, as best as I could looking back, I'm like, man, I really wish I could have said things differently. I feel way more mature in my faith, but we had the conversation and, and ultimately she was like, if you can't wear the Jersey, I can't bring you into camp. Um, and so I didn't get invited back into that camp and got invited back into the national team one other time. I really do think that that was more of like, we don't want a lawsuit to happen from this, um, yeah. which was never on my radar, but, um, yeah, that was kind of like the start <laughs> and end of my national team career, unfortunately. Yeah, well, you hear a lot of feedback on that too. And I'm sure there was many supporting you, obviously, and others that probably just wanted to, you know, rip you to shreds and, yeah. and crush you as, as we see happens. I'm just wondering what it was like for the people that you play soccer with, like even yeah. the people on the national team that you might have known um, and you probably had to have some kind of conversation with at some point. Yeah. I feel like those would be the people, I could be off on this, that would be more supportive after they hear your your reasoning. They may not agree with it, right? but at least be supportive. Was that the case in this? Yeah, very much so. And I really do think that was just the Lord's grace in that season as well. I had been on my professional team um, for about two and a half years at that point. So I had really started to develop relationships and friendships, both with girls that I knew were in same sex marriages, those who were already married, all of us in different lifestyles. But sure. um, I think what was so beneficial of being on that team for so long was that I did have those relationships. And I felt like, man, I really should have a conversation with them before whatever, you know, I think the phrase at the time we picked was uh, personal beliefs or personal reasons. Um, yeah. And so before any of that was put out there, I had asked girls on my team that I knew, you know, had partners or were in that community, if we could have a conversation. And I kid you not, all of them were like, I don't understand why you're being asked to be even wear something like this. Um, wow. They're all very much like as people who don't believe in God, I would never put a cross on a jersey and support that, you know, kind of lifestyle or belief system. And so... I think I was so taken aback by that because I really felt like I had by no means wanted to destroy those relationships. But in turn, they were very much like, I'm really sorry that you're being asked to, you know, make this kind of decision and it's costing you this opportunity. Wow. Yeah. We're missing that, I feel like, just in society, right? Because there's totally. we're about to hit a political season in a, in a month when, you know, we're going to be voting for a president and it's already as we're recording this, it's already gotten ugly if you yeah. just go on social media even a little bit. And I feel like imagine if people who differed in in that thoughts actually sat down and had civilized conversations. There was a time in this in this country when that was a yeah. possibility. And I'm glad it was a lot more recent with what you just described with some of your teammates, because yeah, yeah of course you're gonna be that's why I love about sports, right? It's like this melting pot of people from all different backgrounds and all different nationalities, and everybody knows um, you know, that, okay, not everybody's going to believe the same or come from the same background, but you still figure out how to put it to side, put it to the side. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you can become friends. I mean, I had that when I was at ESPN, like I have great friends who were Jewish and, and from the LGBTQ community and people who I, uh, completely people w on the social media would say, how could you ever even talk about that person positively? And it's like, cause I knew that person and they were my friend. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like we're missing that. I think so. And I think what's made it hard is, is social media because you totally. aren't really forced to have personal relationships. You can have a lot of followers and not have any friends. And I think even though social media was big in 2017, I still had time to develop relationships. And I think that's what, you know, the Lord used to show people of like, Jay's been with you this whole ride. Like, and I would hope they've never felt judged or like felt like, there was like this part of me that felt more righteous than they were. Um, but there was an opportunity to be like friends and teammates and to build that foundational relationship where when this did come up and there was disagreement, it was still like, but I know you as a person, you know me as a person um, and we have each other's backs. And so that I think really helped me get through that season for sure. You continue to pursue soccer, obviously, because you played for many more years. Um, but did you have like this, did you feel like there was this heavy weight that was on your shoulders for standing for Christ because everywhere you went now, whether it's justified or not, like there's the side that's like, yay, Jaylene go. And then there's this like, oh, Jaylene, she's this or she's that. Did yeah. you feel like 
you were able to kind of put that to the side and just play soccer? Or did you feel like you were carrying a little bit of a weight with you? I think it was a little bit of both. I mean, at yeah. home and um, I think in our stadium and surrounded by our fans and teammates, I definitely felt like I could still just be me. Like people were supportive yeah. in a sense. I mean, I know even in our own stadium, there were fans that didn't approve of me anymore. But for the most part, I felt like I could train. I could be around my teammates. Like there wasn't this now like wall built between us and things were awkward and the locker room got weird. Um, but I think what the hardest part was, I think the traveling piece um, going to other stadiums, encountering other people, people that were following me on social media, but didn't know me. So now they're only seeing posts about me. Right. And now we have like all these predetermined assumptions about who I am as a person and I must be toxic in the locker room. And so I, I do think that there was, um, an element of heaviness of like, I'm the only one kind of facing this right now, um, mm. publicly. And that was for sure really hard. I had to assume if other believers chose to play, like let's say they they were in the situation you do and they were like, yeah, I'll wear, I'll wear the Jersey and I'll still play. Um, and it's their decision that that wouldn't have changed your thoughts either. Cause you were making this decision for you. Right. But if somebody else who, who would say they're a follower of Jesus decided to play with that and maybe sought God and, and saw it as, a, I don't know, as a platform to be able to point to Christ in that way. I'm assuming that you would have been fine with that too. Cause you're not sitting here saying like my decision was the decision that every believer should have to make you. This is about you and God and seeking him personally. Right. Yeah. And I even had teammates and a really good friend of mine and we would have hour long discussions about this because she was like, I think I would have made the different decision. And hmm. not that we got into argument, but I think it was sweet in the sense of like iron sharpening iron because it was like, well, I hadn't thought about that, but you make a good point here. And so, yeah, I think it's very much like a personal conviction. I, I'm not saying, as you said, that like my decision now needs to be everyone's decision. Right. Um, totally. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I do think that we have to be able to lay our heads down at night and look ourselves in the mirror and, and know that we made the right decision based off of how the spirit led and not. I mean, because I had so many conversations with people like you could wear the jersey, you could make this statement, you could use it to point people back to Jesus. But I think through, through the conviction that I felt in the time that I had in my own prayer closet, in his word. It was like, I can't wear the jersey and then go look myself in the mirror and be like, I made the right decision because I felt the spirit leading in that sense. So I think my only encouragement is that intentionally, personally pursuing what that conviction looks like and being able to then, you know, go to bed and be like, I obeyed and followed what the Lord asked me. Totally. Yeah. I've met a couple of the Tampa Bay Rays guys. Um, one of them's not with the Rays anymore, who had to kind of confront that as well and had to wear, I think it was a hat that had maybe the LGBTQ or something, or even like a batting practice jersey, and he chose, and they chose not to wear it. And they faced some backlash too and had to answer questions. But I think the way that I saw those, those guys handle it is very similar to the way you're handling it. Like there's never any animosity here. There's just seeking the Lord, trying to be the best, most faithful Christian you can be, seeing what he says, seeking yeah. scripture, and then making the decision for yourself. And that's, it was 2022, right? When that all happened for you again you were in North Carolina and suddenly this is all kind of brought back to the forefront again right yeah and we approached it no differently I mean this time I was married um and so I was able to invite my husband into that with me but we were very much like okay we're gonna seek out about this again it wasn't like this assumption of like well you didn't wear it once so you shouldn't wear it again it was just very much of okay we're gonna go back to scripture we're gonna invite people to pray with us how's the Lord leading this time who do I need to have conversations with if it is the same decision um, and so I think just always being intentional and faithful to whether it is a, a repeat of what's already happened, still seeking the Lord about it again. Yeah. I saw the YouTube clip of you, you were on, um, at Liberty doing the convocation there, uh, which I like to watch those a lot of times. Cause there's just some great people that they have. I mean, I think Michael W. Smith was playing worship yeah. <laughs> on the day that you're up there doing interviews. I'm like, that's up on your music, <laughs> right? Like that's Michael W. Smith. Totally fangirling for sure. <laughs> totally. But what was cool is you were with your husband and he was talking about how he had to kind of walk through his own personal anger and bitterness that he had towards people. Just like I would, if yeah. people were saying stuff about my wife, yeah. Um, and he said he's been released from that, which is really cool. And kind of watching you guys grow in this together was really neat. Um, yeah. But ultimately, soccer ends. And this is where I really want to get to is ministry because you're wearing the shirt. Um, Impact <laughs> City FC, which yeah. is a really cool soccer ministry, has you kind of working with them now. So I'd love to know the pivot 
from playing soccer? And if you always knew you were going to be in ministry and why this feels like the perfect fit for you? Yeah. Um, so I retired, I guess, again in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I really didn't know what I was going to do. Again, I was like, I have a college degree, not really sure what that's going to help me land a job in. Um, and so I actually was our next door neighbors and she works for Compassion International, but she had a good friend that she had played, um, in Charlotte with, and he was on the men's side. She was on the women's side and he started this ministry in Pax City FC. And she knew I was kind of wrestling with this idea of like, I really do want to stay connected to the game in some way. But as you mentioned, I really do have a heart for ministry of just like I want people to um, just connect their lives to what it means to follow God. But also, you know, work a nine to five job like we have to put food on the table and pay bills and all the things. So she made the connection and I wrestled with it for a while. I really didn't know if I wanted to step into this job um, just because of the actual like job itself of, you know, fundraising and helping develop out our nonprofit. And so I prayed about it for a while and got connected. and. I truly love um, just the organization and what we're about of just like developing really strong athletes, but athletes who love the Lord. Um, and so I think it's perfect in the sense of I get to pour into people um, in a spiritual sense, but also like encourage them to like go after their dreams, yeah. um, which is sweet. Impact City FC, people can look it up online. Is there ways that people can get involved like all across the country? Um, yeah. Obviously, they can donate as well. Yes, again. So my um, title is development director. And so I'm over the fundraising and just developing out our like vision for what we want to do. And so we're a mission centered, gospel centered soccer club. And our goal is to um, train up athletes, Christian athletes. And so we're in five cities right now, four stateside. Um, we actually just launched our first international location in Cap Haitian, Haiti, which is really cool. Our yeah. um, Our sporting director is from Haiti. And so he has a huge heart. Um, for the people there and obviously they love soccer maybe a little bit more than we Americans do and so it's a it's a really cool spot to be involved with but we do everything from like pro chaplaincy to um, missions and experiences we obviously have the club side club soccer side but we also do inner city work and so we kind of just try and put our hands into everything that soccer touches and so um, one of the ways that people can give is through impactcityfc.com and um, we operate from very similar ways of like compassion. Um, it's $40 a month and that goes to sponsoring um, kids to like play. It can go any, it can reach anything from our inner city programs, providing snacks during the weeks for those opportunities for kids to come out and play. It can go towards scholarshiping um, players who may not have the resources to play the astronomical soccer fees that U.S. soccer charges, but are talented yeah. enough to go far. And so we just want to provide opportunities for um, athletes to go out and be incredible soccer players, but also ones who are leading in their communities and spaces and drawing people into Jesus. That's awesome. Yeah. Impactcityfc.com, you said. And um, yeah, I mean, I think about like if you get a cup of coffee a day at Dunkin' Donuts or somewhere, um, you're spending way more than 40 bucks. Imagine if you could actually spend that money, that $40 towards helping a kid learn about Jesus, but also pursue their dreams in the soccer space. That's pretty cool. So yeah, totally. love that. Love that. Yeah. Jaylene, thank you so much for being here. This is awesome to catch up again and uh, love your story. Love how open and bold you are for the gospel and uh, always rooting for you and uh, appreciate you. you coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a joy. Hey, thanks for watching Sports Spectrum here on YouTube. You can click our next video or you can check out our website, sportsspectrum.com.